Hello everybody, welcome to Mike's Mike. My name is Factually, Contractually and Logistically Mike. For this video, I am going to be serving video essay realness. It's a little different to the content I usually do, so if you enjoy it, please let me know by liking the video and maybe leaving me a comment. Ta. For this video, I wanted to talk about the influencer to pop star pipeline. And when I say pipeline, I'm just talking about the trend of social media stars making their way into the mainstream through music, whether successfully or unsuccessfully. We're gonna look at some examples across a bunch of different platforms and maybe even review a song or two. Pause, <laughs> put your paws up. Yes, I'm a little monster. Disclaimer, I am not an expert. I listen to a lot of music, yes, but does that make me an expert? No, well maybe, no. So if I have an opinion on a song not being good, that's just my opinion and that might not be how you feel about the song and that is okay. At the same time, I'm not going to be S word. It hasn't been a minute in the video, so I can't swear yet. I'm not going to be S wording over all the songs from social media stars. So if that's what you're looking for in this video, then maybe you won't find that or maybe you will. Also what defines good and bad music is subjective. I guess in this video, good music refers to artists or songs that find commercial success or in the case of small creators, it's more that they've built a community that really loves everything that they put out. And bad music will be referring to just blatant cash grabs. You can see that there's no real intention to put effort into it and make a career out of it. They just want a quick dollar. <laughs> Maybe a bit more than one dollar. That being said, in general, there are songs that fit that description and they're still fun to listen to. I can't make the music not bop. If it hits, it hits. Besties, let's go back to the start. What is an influencer? I really hate the term influencer. It aggravates me. It aggravates my soul. I feel an itch that I need to scratch when I hear the term influencer. When someone calls me an influencer, maybe I want to run into a wall. Giving very much start of Beautiful by Christina Aguilera, which is like, don't look at me. It's embarrassing. I think it's because of the company that gets looped into the umbrella when you make the term influencer fit anyone that uploads content to the internet. And I guess by that definition, if you yourself, yes, you audience member, if you have ever uploaded something to the internet and someone has viewed it, you're an influencer. Wait a minute, hold on. Also, what am I influencing? You shouldn't be looking at people who upload mp4 files to youtube.com for all your big brain discourse. No, no. According to the original girl boss, Marion Webster, the first known use of influencer was in 1662. So the girls have been influencing for a while. Mary Beth was walking around promoing skinny tea to anyone that would listen. Use code plague for 10% off. Their definition is one who exerts influence, a person who inspires or guides the actions of others. Ew. Often specifically a person who is able to generate interest in something such as a consumer product by posting about it on social media. So yes, I don't like the term influencer and I feel like a more appropriate title for this video would be investigating the social media star to pop star pipeline. But that is just too many letters for the algorithm and I feel like I'm already on thin ice with her and I don't want to push it. Also, let's be clear, people hate influencers. The general public, they do not like influencers, but there are definitely some people who I'm going to be talking about that give me pause. And I definitely don't think they'd be coming on at the club. The one thing that will unite the people on this giant rock spinning around a fireball in infinite space is the hatred for influencers. Maybe Dixie is a peacekeeper after all. The real peacekeeper was the friends we made along the way. What? I think a good example of the public disdain for influencers is from this article in the LA Times called Paris Hilton, Hollywood's Original Influencer. You could easily label this the decade of the influencer. Those YouTube and Instagram stars who make money by selling face-tuned versions of themselves while hawking face creams, fashion collaborations, protein powder, and how to improve your life seminars. Through their social media posts, they convince thousands or millions of fans and admirers to like what they like and want what they want. I don't know what accent that was, but it just felt right. I love this quote because it just makes it sound like all influencers are part of some grand scheme that this giant evil corporation paying all the minions to influence the masses. Like, come on, I just want to upload my little video files to the internet, have a little laugh, and then that's it. Shut the computer, go to sleep. But since technically everyone who uploads content is under that term influencer, there are people that definitely fit that description. And just by reading it, I can already think of like three or four that I'm just like, Ugh. And I guess that's why YouTube tries to call YouTubers content creators, our content creators. How long until influencer is like a curse word? You're an influencer, brackets, derogatory. So this article talks about how Paris is one of the first, if not the first influencer. And I agree with 
with that. But I also think it would be wrong to just say that TV and movie celebrities from before that weren't doing what influencers are kind of doing now. But I would say Paris Hilton is definitely one of the first people that the general public liked to frame as being famous for doing nothing or only famous because she was in a uh -huh. And she's a great starting point for this influencer to pop star pipeline discussion. Also, I'm not gonna sit here and defend everything that Paris Hilton's done in however many years, but I will say there's definitely a lot more behind the scenes than what she was being shown as in the tabloids. In terms of music, Paris Hilton has made one studio album, nine singles and 12 music videos. She released her debut album called Paris on August 22nd, 2006, and the album peaked at number six on the Billboard 200, which is insane. That's a big deal. That's commercial success. Um, I'm going to talk about this a bit more later, but I think we're kind of skewed now by always reading the statistics about how this Ariana Grande album or Taylor Swift album debuted at number one. So we're kind of used to that, but that is crazy. Also side note, the week that Paris's album hit number six on the Billboard 200, at number five, we had the Cheetah Girls 2 soundtrack. We as a society did not do enough for the Cheetah Girls. Maybe I need to do a video about the CGCU, the Cheetah Girls Cinematic Universe. You gotta like you mean also the album Paris is good. I will stand by that. It's like 2000s personified in an album and it's fun. So by far Paris's most well-known musical venture is the single that came off this album called Stars Are Blind. Are this song did what it needed to do. This is the first influencer song we're going to talk about. Let's have a look at some of the lyrics. Even though the gods are crazy, even though the stars are blind. Wait. If you show me real love, baby, I'll show you mine. So obviously there's some innuendos in here, but literally every song from the 2000s is just one big innuendo. I'm like a 12 year old that learned the word innuendo and I just keep using it. Innuendo. Innuendo. Hmm. Innuendo. So the song was generally positively received by critics and it peaked at 18 on the Billboard Hot 100. And the overall response seemed to be that people were surprised that this person who seemingly isn't good at anything other than being famous managed to come out with a fun, catchy song. So the track was worked on by Fernando Garibay, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, who also has credits on most tracks from Born This Way, which has its 10th anniversary this week. So pause up. Yes, you better be streaming. And they also worked on tracks from Pink Friday, Roman Reloaded, and this just all makes sense. Maybe correlation does imply causation. I guess what I'm trying to say by talking about who worked on the song is that there was some serious money behind this. And the money discussion is definitely a huge chunk of the pipeline because at the end of the day, if you have enough money, you can essentially make anyone a star or you can make a solid attempt at making someone a star. So Paris comes out with a banger and her album peaks at number six on the Billboard 200. What a precedent. What next? Let's pivot five years later. Bestie slash minion of Paris, Kim Kardashian comes out with jam brackets turn it up and they play in my jam. i think it's fair to say the kardashians are no strangers to a slightly off business venture that la times paragraph i think when the author wrote it they must have been thinking about the kardashians because i'm reading that and i'm thinking about them and i'm like it links up. And yes, while I liked laughing at memes from Keeping Up The Kardashians and I like to laugh at whatever shit comes up on TikTok about Kendall and Kylie, I think it's fair to say the Kardashians are first and foremost money makers and probably a good representation of late stage capitalism. Is that a hot take? The hot take would be that people should not be looking at those who upload JPEGs and PNGs to the internet as role models but that's a discussion for another time. So Kim Kardashian dropped jam brackets, turn it up. And I keep including the brackets, turn it up because it's important. I think dropped is good terminology because mm, when she released it, it fell and it fell hard. Flop, turn it down. The song tanked in comparison to Stars Are Blind and was absolutely demolished by critics. Here's a fun quote from one of the reviews. Dead brained piece of generic dance music without a single distinguishing feature. But also they called it generic dance music. It's like that Regina George bit, which is like, so you agree, you think you're pretty. So you agree, you think it's dance music. Turn me up, turn me up. Turn me, turn me, turn me up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Turn me up, turn me up. Turn me, turn me, turn me up. Yeah, 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 yeah. Everybody moved. I do want to talk about the single cover. I just feel nothingness. It's like 
looking at a wall that's just been painted, but just painted one color. Like you recognize that the wall has been freshly painted, but you're like, it's just a wall and it's just one color. And I have fumes in my nose now. That was the end of Kim's journey into music. And while Kylie hasn't released music as of yet, I think the threat is always there. That reminds me of that tweet from Idolator in 2017. Jessie J is threatening to release a new album. I've mentioned that tweet in a video before, but I always think about it because it's just so casually vicious. Like what did Jessie do? So those are some examples of early influencers releasing music to mix reviews. Porting over an existing audience to a new medium. That should be the title of my autobiography once I work out how to do it and a debut number one in the Billboard Hot 100. Imagine. The absolute societal collapse. Let's talk about YouTubers doing just that. I mean, not the debuting at number one part, and that sounds shady, but I'm not being shady. I think now's a good time to talk about the charts. Debuting at number one is quite literally almost impossible. As I was saying before, I think people really underestimate just how difficult it is to get on the chart at all, let alone get into the top 10, let alone debut in the top 10 on both the Billboard Hot 100 and the Billboard 200. For example, let's take Dua Lipa. She's an absolute mega successful powerhouse icon legend boots the house Charlie XCX snatch my wig bring into the runway. <laughs> but she doesn't have a number one on the Billboard Hot 100 or the Billboard 200. Sick and twisted, sick and twisted, sickery, twistery. I've done a podcast episode about how the charts work, but maybe I should do something on the main channel as well. My general thoughts on using these two charts to measure success is that it's a bit crusty, especially since it's just streams inside the US. So pitting international artists on this scale that is so skewed to US audiences isn't necessarily fair. Plus, as I said at the start, success can be measured in so many different ways. Like I would say Charlie XCX is a trailblazing icon, but maybe she doesn't chart as high on the Billboard Hot 100 as Jim from the States who's singing about a truck. And as much as I hate to admit it, maybe that's okay. All right, back to YouTube. We're gonna talk about MagCon and TikTok and all that later, but I think YouTube is a good starting point for talking about real influencer influencers moving into music because YouTube was the first platform that really prioritized video. There were obviously social media platforms before YouTube, but if people were already going to YouTube to consume music content in the form of like music videos, then if you're uploading content to YouTube as covers and that kind of thing, it was realistic to assume that people might see your content. Actually, I lied. <laughs> Let's talk about MySpace quickly. I just wanted to give an example on how wild the internet is. Did you know that Nicki Minaj has a song with Jeffree Star? It's called Lollipop Luxury, and I just want you to let that sink in. I don't like Jeffree Star. He's like YouTube Voldemort. Anyway, I think that track happened because of MySpace, because that's where he was uploading and that's how he was getting big and everything, blah, 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 and life moves on. I don't want to talk about Tom Free, Riddle Star anymore. But the point I wanted to make was that people have been using social media to get their music found since the beginning of time. The cavemen were doing it. <laughs> that first mammal that walked out of the ocean, she was uploading her MP3 files to SoundCloud. And I feel like the introduction of YouTube, sorry, I'm stretching, because this is like the longest I've sat down to record a video forever. I feel like the introduction of YouTube was kind of like giving caffeine to a toddler, where the toddler is someone that can sing and the caffeine is a platform for people to consume that talent. Now, I obviously have a personal bias towards YouTube because that's kind of what I do, but don't get it twisted. I also hate this website. I do think YouTube is a good way to kickstart a career heading into that kind of area. All you need is a bit of talent and personality. In fact, you don't even need both of those. If this is the scale and you're 100% on the talent end, as long as there's enough money behind you, you can still sell records. And if you're 100% personality and no talent, and again, there's enough money behind you, you can port that audience over and just claim it's a meme song until it's not a meme song and it's a real song. More on that at eight. <laughs> I haven't said this in a while on the channel and you seem to have forgotten it, but I have a master's degree in mechanical engineering. Why is that relevant? <laughs> it's not. <laughs> but I wanted to give you all a diagram to work with. This is a Venn diagram of talent and personality. And let's start at the center. Intersection of talent and personality. That's actually such a huge compliment and I don't give compliments easy. So if you're in this, you better appreciate it. All right, everyone, I want you to participate in the following activity. I want you to think about a person who started by uploading cute little YouTube videos. Pause, that's me. 
and now they're a mega successful pop star. The first person who comes to mind is probably Troy Sivan, right? I think Troy Sivan is probably one of the most successful real YouTuber to mainstream converts. I know there are other people that made covers and got picked up by record labels, but Troy was a YouTuber in every sense of the word. I'm talking collabs, I'm talking challenges, I'm talking VidCon, I'm talking dating rumors, the whole lot. He's kind of like the blueprint for this sort of thing. The pink print, the Troy print. Where the bobs at? Life has just been so good since Nikki dropped Beam Me Up Scotty on streaming. It's not related to this content at all, but it just, oh, am I right? It's pretty clear that at this point, Troy Sivan is more famous for the stuff that he's done after YouTube than what he did on YouTube. If you look at his socials, he's got like 11 million followers on Instagram. And I think at his peak, he has something like 4 million subscribers on YouTube. So obviously the majority of his followers came from after he went into music. So how did he do it? It all comes down to the diagram. He had 4 million subscribers on YouTube from essentially just being himself. So tick personality. And while making those typical like YouTuber videos from the early 2010s, he was also uploading covers and original songs. So tick talent. He released his first major label EP called TRXYE in 2014, which peaked at number five on the Billboard 200. I remember when he dropped it, I was like, oh cool, new trickster. EP. New Trixie EP just dropped. I feel like replacing letters in titles is just so very 2014. Not an attack, just a fact. I mean, Miss Pink has been yelling in the eye slot since the beginning of time. He also dropped a wild EP in 2015 and Blue Neighborhood in the same year. Side note, the word neighborhood is just, it's aggravating. I don't like it. I just can't handle the word neighborhood. It's so many letters. And the start of it is so horsey, you know, like neighborhood. And for what? Overall, his most successful album chart outing so far has been Bloom, which peaked at number four in 2018. And I would say that really cemented him as a queer icon in pop music. Also, dance to this. Everybody moved. Name someone who didn't move. You can't, there's no one because everyone moved. Let's not undersell, ooh. <laughs> Let's not undersell how iconic it was that he worked with Ariana Grande on that song. And she's one of the biggest pop girls on this rock. But as you all know, it has long been prophesied since the beginning of time, since the big bang, that there could only be one brown haired Australian YouTuber that used to live in Perth and now lives in Melbourne. So I think Troy could sense that I was arriving and got out of the game. So thank you, Troy. Who else have we got? Other successful examples that come to mind are Conan Gray, and Dodie, who also just released an album, Stream Build a Problem. I would say Conan Gray kind of followed the Troy print because his debut album peaked at number five on the Billboard 200, which again, wild. <laughs> wow, uh, uh. Conan's also had a Billboard Hot 100 top 50 single with Heather, which went viral on TikTok, but I'll talk more about how songs go viral on TikTok. <laughs> More at night. But yes, a clear distinction that I wanted to make with these artists compared to the ones I'm about to talk about is that singing has always been part of their content or like they made it clear they were passionate about that. So when they pivoted into music, it felt authentic. And now back to this Jake Paul that had a lot of boxed about the other day in the press. <laughs> I'm going to try and restrain myself here. I'm not the biggest fan to say the least. In my opinion, it's one thing to act the way he does online and offline, but it's a totally different thing to cultivate a young audience and do all of that stuff with them watching. But that's not for this video. Remember that era of like Rice Gum versus Jake Paul? If we made it through that, we can make it through anything. And the songs that came out of that, we had It's Every Day Bro, It's Every Night Sis, The Fall of Jake Paul by Logan Paul, exhausting. Absolutely exhausting. If we're looking at views alone, these songs were absolutely huge. All of these videos have over 200 million views, which is a lot for one of the main pop stars, let alone a YouTuber song. But as I said before, there's a distinction between these songs and the ones I mentioned before. These are meme songs. There doesn't seem to be an intention from these people to make it bigger the music industry because they're really passionate about making music. They all capitalized off a situation they found themselves in, turned it into a music video. They got views and streams and hundreds of millions, which equates to what audience? Money. And there are also other people who kind of fit somewhere around there, but I don't know what their goal is. Like Tana Mojo, like what is her goal? Is her goal to make music or to make money? And I think you can do both of those things, but then it's clearly some people will just want to do the second part, which is fine. If you like these meme songs, you like these meme songs. But in my opinion, they can't compete where they don't compare. 
Ugh. My 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 by Troy Sivan, real song. Bitch Lasagna by PewDiePie, meme song. Walkman by Tiny Meat Gang. Is it a real song or is it a meme song? Or is it Hannah Montana limo out front bet the both the world? <laughs> it's a meme song, but it's good. I think TMG is the way to go. If you're a YouTuber that wants to make music, but you come from this background of creating content that's funny. It's just jokey enough that if the song doesn't find commercial success, the audience that it was intended for, which is the audience from YouTube and other platforms, will still enjoy it. And it's still just a fun little outing. But at the same time, the production value on these types of songs is getting really good, both in terms of the production on the song and also the money behind the music video, and also like featuring artists like Black Bear. At what point is it not a joke anymore? <sighs> Let's quickly talk about the MagCon situation. While YouTube is very much in my wheelhouse, I don't know that much about MagCon, but there are definitely some names from it that I recognize. According to dictionary.com, MagCon was an event featuring young online stars from platforms like Instagram and Vine who toured the US to meet their fans. Apparently the name MagCon comes from meet and greet convention, which I'm sure at some stage I knew that but it just feels like new information. And I guess some of the notable examples that come from the MagCon era are Cameron Dallas, Shawn Mendes, and then Mahogany Locks. I feel like Shawn Mendes really wants to park that part of his history, but it's important, Shawn. You can't leave MagCon in the dust, it's important. Shawn Mendes is a mega star now, and yes, he was uploading covers to YouTube, but his biggest platform was Vine, and it really makes you think, would he have got this far without MagCon? Also, I was so triple G, girl boss gaslit gate kept, when I realized that the girl who was the DJ at MagCon was the girl who sings, I can take your man if I want to. I also find it interesting that even though Cameron and Sean were both in MagCon and they're both making music to some degree at the moment, they're in such different stages. Not an attack, just a fact. All right, let's talk about TikTok and his stretch again. That chair needs some WD-40. Before we get into the juicy TikTok discussion, I just wanted to make a 100,000 IQ point. If an artist releases a song that does well on its own without social media support, they're gonna be called an industry plan, correct? So I guess if you wanna be a pop star, your options are be an industry plan, be mega rich, get big on a given social media network and port your audience over, or hope your song goes viral through some trend or because someone more famous recognized and shared it. Let's say you don't have the connections to be an industry plan, which I have nothing against, by the way. I hate the really negative connotation associated with being an industry plan. Like if the music hits, the music hits. It has been said several times on the internet. I can't make the music not bop. If I'm gonna shake my ass, I'm gonna shake my ass, and that's that on that. So we're saying you don't have the connections and you're not mega rich. I think that depends on what you're- No, no. That wasn't a question. So you're either relying on your song going viral or building a big enough platform to then pour your audience over to your music. And this is where it gets interesting. With the nature of the content being so quickly consumed and how fast trends move, I would say that TikTok is both the easiest to grow on, but then also has the biggest cliff to fall off in terms of losing momentum. Let's go back to that. Ooh, <laughs> let's go back to that YouTube Venn diagram from before. I think we need to add another section for people who don't fit into, oh, how do I put this nicely? They have neither, but they're still successful. Oh my God, I don't know how else to say it. I'm done, I'm over, I'm canceled. Let's say their strengths lie in places that aren't necessarily talent or personality. Is that better? Let's add a circle for aesthetic. You might be like, well, what the fuck does aesthetic mean in this context? Well, audience member that has so graciously sat through the vast majority of this video, I will tell you right now, the aesthetic category is for people who are hot and their job is being hot. Every day I wake up hot and get in my hot car and go to my hot job and do my hot little tasks. So for example, the TikTokers that just do the big dance trends and then some sexy lip singing. Their job is being hot and that's okay. If I was built like that, I would be shaking my ass for a case to buy sponsorship as well. Before we put some names on the chart, oh my God, a hair just fell onto me while I'm talking. The curse of Bryce Hall. Before we put names on the chart, let's talk about the TikTok algorithm and the translation from TikTok song to chart song. At this point, if a song does really well on TikTok, it's gonna do well on streaming and it's probably gonna do well on the charts as well. That's why all the main pop girlies are trying to like make dances and trends to their songs as soon as they release them. If it catches on and videos that have the sound have like hundreds of millions or even billions of views, 
a chunk of that audience is going to stream the song. Now imagine you personally decide that you're going to start making music and you also have a TikTok following of 70 million people. The audience just boom, 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 you know, boom, boom, pow. Maybe the Black Eyed Peas had it right all along. There is so much money behind TikTokers at this level. And it's because record labels also see the absolutely insane possibilities that come out of having someone with a relatively clean image and an audience of 70 million people. Why am I talking like this is a conspiracy? I feel like this is widely known. The first example I would like to talk about is Build a Bitch by Bella Port. Ch this ain't build a bitch. She's the third most followed person on TikTok with 69 million followers. Miss Porch came out swinging on this track and I did not expect it. Her regular TikTok content, let's just say, I'm not the target audience. But I went through her profile and she did sometimes upload videos of her singing and she was a good singer. So the song, huge. The music video is almost at 100 million views in like a week. And if you compare that with Dixie who uploaded a song at the same time and it had like 6 million views in the same period of time. 100 million versus 6 million, that's a big difference. There's obviously a bunch of reasons that go into that difference, but I would say in addition to being a catchy song, the music video is solid. There's some big money behind this song and to put that much money into all the editing and the production for the music video without having any prior music before that, you can tell that the record label can see the importance of a solid debut for Miss Bella. I think she's gonna go boss. Now I'm not gonna start talking about Dixie D'Amelio and just rat on all of her songs because she deals with that a lot already, but uh, she seems like a nice person, but if she's gonna make music her career, something's gotta shift. And I do think she's making changes and heading in the right direction, but that, that she stumbled on that One Hog Day song. I'm still not over it. The kids boppery over it all. For one day, one day, I was really, 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 really sad. For one day, one whole day, I missed you really, really, really bad. However, One Whole Day features Wiz Khalifa. That's a big deal. But even that Be Happy song was just, it's kids bop. It was definitely a thing that happened. Yeah, let's say that. And then you have Miss Addison Rae coming into Girl boss at the speed of a thousand MLMs. <laughs> I don't think she's really in the same category as Dixie and Bella because she's kind of got that she's the man revamp thing coming on. And at the end of the day, after a day being on set, she just goes chills and eats salad with Kourtney Kardashian. So, but the key thing is huge following, lots of money. I've been seeing some interaction on TikTok and on Twitter between Addison Rae and Charlie XCX and the angels are pressed. The fans are like, no, nah, I would rather die than see those two collab, but I'm like, if it hits, it hits. And if she works with Addison, Addison's got a huge platform. It's a win for Charlie as well. So I will be streaming. So all of these people that I've been talking about are coming into the music area with established, huge following. The cool thing about TikTok is that you don't have to be massive to start something. There's an Australian TikToker called Peach PRC, and I really like her songs, and I wouldn't have found her without TikTok. And I really like those smaller artists that are kind of coming into the hyper pop space and making really fun and exciting music. If it weren't for social media, I would not be at a hyper pop party yelling, play Chase Icon at the DJ. Yes, the DJ ignored me. Actually, my track record with requesting songs is pretty much zero. To summarize, I think the influencer to pop star pipeline is an interesting one. It started off with your Parises and your Kims, and then it headed into the MySpace notoriety, and then we had Vine and MagCon and YouTube, and now we're kind of at this area with TikTok where you can turn into a megastar quite quickly. I think social media is more and more a way for artists to get found. And in my opinion, the more music, the better. And if the music sucks, at least we'll have something to talk about. I am exhausted from talking. That is so much talking. That was sick and twisted. If you've made it this far, thank you, first of all. And if you enjoyed it, feel free to leave a like, let me know in the comments your thoughts, or if you like this format and you have topics that you want me to talk about, feel free to leave them in the comments. I do talk about more of this long form type of thing on my podcast, so be sure to check that out. So yeah, thank you all so much for watching and I'll talk to you all soon. Also, if you see me dropping a single, mind your business and stream. Bye. Welcome to the end screen. Here you will find another video for you to watch and a link to easily subscribe to my channel. So make sure you subscribe to my channel. Let me roll my eyes. Now I can't remember how to roll my eyes, it's getting weird.